I did my duty. Uh, that was the Iran did a great job, really, setting up where we are today and how we came to, to the point that we are. And many of the problems that Iran stated, you will see the flow of the same type of problems and issues that we have to struggle with when I go through these documents. The, uh, as Ron said, the prescriptive design doesn't tell us, really, it's not intended to tell us how the building is going to behave. It gives us a set of rules that if you follow, uh, you hope, or, or based on past experience, generally you have had uh, safe buildings. But because most of the code-based design is based on elastic analysis, it is virtually impossible using elastic analysis to forecast what would happen when your building gets near collapse, which is a very nonlinear stage of behavior. So it is sort of unfair to ask the code procedures to give you that kind of an answer. Now, besides that, tall buildings are their own unique animals. They are different from ordinary buildings. They have long periods. They have multi-mode behavior. The uh, P-delta effects are significant. They have large occupancy. If something happens to them, the impact on the neighborhood is going to be an order of magnitude, probably more than you know a couple of two-story, three-story buildings um, that might collapse. And then, as Ron said, we have evolved. You know, we have come a long way from you know linear, static, and dynamic or modal response spectrum analysis to today. I mean, ten years ago, we couldn't imagine the type of things that we are doing today. And with computing advances, we now can do a stuff that we could not do 10, 15 years ago. So that's why we, we are doing the things the way we are doing today. I'm pretty sure with the ad advancement in computing uh, facilities and the speed, then we are going to do the new generation much faster than we are doing today. And that's the stuff that Ron is going to talk to you towards the end of the day. Now, in fairness, we sh really shouldn't have asked the code guys to predict or give us a set of rules to design tall buildings because tall buildings is not what their cup of tea is. If you look at the construction anywhere, in the United States for example, more than 90% of construction is buildings less than four stories. Only 1% of construction, I'm talking numbers, is more than 1%. So the code writer is not going to concentrate on 1% of the problem. He's going to concentrate on 99% of the problem. Uh, one example, in 2002, Los Angeles City Code has a drift requirement, which was a function of the period of the building. The people who wrote this, they were looking at four-story, five-story buildings. They didn't imagine what would happen if you try to apply this to a 30-story, 40-story building. The one lucky guy who was talking to you today tried to do that. And then he said, well, it, this provision actually prohibits having buildings taller than 30 story, 40 story in Los Angeles because, you know, when the period goes up, the drift limit becomes so tight, you can't do it. Now, fortunately, we talked to them and that, that, that provision was retracted. Okay. Now... Another problem is that sometimes you want to do, I don't know why I didn't get the one that I wanted to get, but also sometimes you want to do new systems. You have new, new, uh, new systems or new technology that you want to use, like this one, the core wall system. I would say nine out of 10 tall buildings that has been constructed in the United States over the past 10 years, at least Western United States, uses this. Uh, particular system that most of the lateral resistance is concentrated in a core wall. Well, you can't go above 240 feet with a shear wall only system according to the codes. So how did these guys get around this limitation? What would happen if you want to use something else like the hybrid systems that will be presented to you? Uh, well, there are not code provisions for those because code writers didn't anticipate every problem that we are going to have when you try to push the envelope. Well, fortunately, there is mechanisms and clauses in every code 
that gives you a path out into something like what we are doing today that is using performance based. I'm not going to read this to you, but I'm just showing you an example. For example, in 2002 of IBC, there is a section that tells you, you know, uh, what we are saying here doesn't limit you from doing something that is rational and you can justify. So these alternative means clauses are there, and those are the pathways in using things like performance based design. Now, ASC 710 has similar provision there. So, we are talking about equivalence or superior performance. Well, the only way to do this is to have an acceptable methodology, as some sort of seismic hazard evaluation that makes sense, some acceptable modeling and analysis techniques, and some rational acceptance criteria. Well, that's where these guidelines come in. There are quite a few of them. As Ron said, two of them are mostly used and they are in a sense similar. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to concentrate on the two that people use most and try to present what they have in common together and then I only distinguish the differences when they are different so that you know uh, where, where the differences are. The both of the documents use ASC 41 and ASC 7 standards at, as their backbones. They also, in more or less, refer to a document ATC 72-1, which is a very important document for design of tall buildings. So and it's freely available. Now there are jurisdictional differences in adaptation of these guidelines. For example, in Los Angeles, you use, you, you, you we use the guideline and, and that is it. If you satisfy the guideline and the peer review, you are done. In San Diego, for example, you can take one exception or two exceptions to the code, but then you have to produce a code compliant building with those two or one or two exceptions and then satisfy the peer review as well. So the fact that these standards are in place doesn't mean that the way they are applied are the same in different cities. The uh, general outline of the PRTBR document is, uh, as you see on the screen, it starts from an introduction. They give you some performance objectives, some process for how you, you go over and put your preliminary design together, a service level evaluation, an MCE evaluation, and how you pre present your results. The PRTBR document is more detailed than LA tall building documents, 100 pages or so. The LA document is about 50 pages or so and it has sort of the general flow it doesn't have as much detail in it as uh, as the peer TBI has the main reason is that the people who put LA tall building together are practitioners they don't write as much as our academic friends do but I have been on both and both of them are basically fine Now ASC 41, as Ron said, is officially intended for seismic rehab rehabilitation of existing buildings. But its component-based performance limits and nonlinear dynamic procedure, it, they're routinely referenced by these guidelines and basically ASC 41 is the backbone on which these two guidelines are built. Now, if you believe that ASC 41 limits for a particular component or something or action that you are doing are too conservative or they are not applicable to the design, you have the, the opportunity to present and substantiate other limits. And actually, a lot of designers do that. They go in, they test some, some you know, you have a coupling beam and you think ASC 41 limits for rotations are small, well, test, test your proportions test your detailing and come up with the appropriate rotations for your uh, proposed design and you can use them and people have done that. Peer review and approval is always necessary if you deviate from ASC 41. That's sort of a universal rule. Now as far as performance objectives go, uh, the 2010 TBI has two per basic performance objectives. One is equivalency to the code that Ron talked about. 
And then the other is enhanced performance objective, that if you want to do better. But there are not a lot of details spelled out in that document on how you do the EPO. Most of the talk in peer document is about the basic performance objective. The 2014 LA Tower building, they, they sort of want to give you a serviceable performance on the frequent events and some sort of a repairable building estate after rare events. The hazard levels that these two documents consider that is for the frequent event that they check for serviceability is a 43 year return earthquake which is 50% in 30 years that's where you want your building to be functional and then the MCE or MCER which is 2% in 50 years with, with a lot of mumbo jumbo that has been added to it uh, for collapse uh, prevention. Notice that these documents do away with design basis event, which used to be 10% in 50 years, 500 years, because they, th the assumption is that if you do the for serviceability and you do collapse check, you cover that and you don't need an independent third check for it. Now, if you practice in San Diego, to satisfy the building code, you have to do that design basis check anyhow. <coughs> but if you are in Los Angeles, you don't have to do that. Uh, as you know, ASC 41 permits four types of analysis from linear static procedure, you know, modal response to spectral analysis, pushover, and nonlinear time history analysis. The tall buildings, both of the uh, guidelines, both of them let you use only two methods. For serviceability or for MCE, you can always use. It has to be three dimensional, nonlinear <coughs> dynamic procedure. No ifs or buts about that. If, but the only exception is for serviceability check, you can use modal response spectrum analysis because you are essentially elastic at that stage. But for everything else, you have to use nonlinear uh, dynamic procedure or, or time history analysis. Service about behavior, the way it's defined is that basically you want the building to be functional after that a small event, the 43 year event. Now if you have to you know, shut down a piece of the building for two hours or three hours or four hours, that's okay. But if you have to shut it down for a week, obviously you don't have a service about behavior. And then, you know, as Ron said, we are talking about a low probability of collapse under MCE. You know, how low, it's, you know, it's subject to who you talk to. Uh, but we, we, the demands are checked for all the structural members, lateral as well as gravity system. Now, another difference between these guidelines and other documents is that you have to include the gravity system to the extent that it would affect your lateral behavior in your model. So you can't have, for example, a core wall building in which you have only the core wall in there and no columns because the most columns through a slab and a triggering effect are going to perform, uh, in, participate somehow in the behavior. So the models that are built according these, to these documents are pretty detailed and they have a lot more than just the lateral system in them. Both guidelines use capacity design principles in which the designer has to identify where the anticipate nonlinear behavior is going to take place, detail for it, and make sure that everything else is a stronger and remains essentially elastic. Now, this is one example of the you one person defining, you know, where the inelasticity is permitted. And it's a suggested table, it's not, you know, it's not gospel. It's one way of doing things, one, one way of showing things. Um, and there are other possible mechanisms that you can come up with. Now, all actions must be classified as either force controlled or deformation controlled. That is common, ASC 41 does the same thing. Force controlled actions must further be categorized as either critical or non-critical. So there are some shear that is critical 
There is some shear that is not critical, but both shears are force control. Now this is one example of such classification. For example, you could say my below grade perimeter walls in flexure, I want them to stay elastic, I don't want them to move a lot. So they are force controlled, but they are not critical. In shear, they are critical. Or for more, more for the floor slabs, if, or, or diaphragms, if you have a transition at the podium, then the shear is critical and the flexure is critical. But if you are or, ordinary diaphragm, you can term them not critical. Now evaluation procedures, as I said, they both require a full three-dimensional detailed mathematical model. They also want a realistic estimates of a stiffness, strength, and damping. Particularly that realistic estimate of a, st a stiffness is, is used for the serviceability check part. And uh, LA tall building document uses expected material properties and the reduction factor, a fee factor of one, regardless. Uh, Pierre TBI uses the same for MCE except for a fee factor of 0.75 for shear. And then when you go to serviceability, it depends on the method that you use. I'll talk about that when we get there. They, the sort of conversion between nominal strength that you get based on a specified steel properties or concrete properties and the strength that you use in analysis expected strength is in a table like this. For example, for, for concrete, you can use 1.3 times the specified uh, strength that you get and both documents use the same table. The table for effective stiffness is a little different and in fairness to peer document, they are different because LA Tall Building has gone through a couple of cycles after 2010. So then, then they have diverged a little. They are very similar, but the tables are different. Uh, they are in your handout, so you can see the differences. They are not significant, the difference. They're somewhat different. Both documents say you should use 2.5% damping in a state of 5% damping for serviceability. Uh, but they permit a demand capacity ratio of 1.5 for deformation controlled members because they anticipate that this is elastic but it's not fully elastic. The damping actually you will see that for MCE also viscous damping is reduced to 2.5% because you are actually modeling the hysteretic damping with nonlinear methods so you can't you know, double the use of damping in, in the analysis. The uh, LA document limits the demand capacity ratio in serviceability to 70% for force controlled members, just to make sure that they stay in place and they are not cracked up that much. As I said before, the 2000 peer uh, requirements for collapse prevention are more elaborate and detailed than the uh, tall building document. Neither document has a minimum base shear capacity requirement. That's another difference with the codes because they think by following these sophisticated rules, you do not need that. Now for serviceability, you can either use linear response spectrum analysis with the rules that you always follow, or you can use nonlinear dynamic response analysis. For MCE, as I said before, you must use nonlinear dynamic response analysis. Now, both documents require you to consider, because it's a three-dimensional model, the inherent torsional properties of the structural system is going to be modeled. The difference is how you deal with accidental eccentricity. And in LA document, they say, well, look at the implications of accidental eccentricity, the amplification that you get during the serviceability evaluation. And if it is significant, in MCE evaluation, talk to peer review and come up with a way to solve that problem. And if you show in serviceability that accidental eccentricity is not important, then, then you don't need to evaluate it in MCE level. Peer says don't bother with it, it's not important. And actually, I have been more involved in the LA one than peer one, 
But I like Pier 1 better on this. Consideration of accidental eccentricity is messy. It takes a lot of analysis and usually doesn't give you much. Now, floor diaphragms, we say they shall be included in a mathematical model using realistic stiffness properties. Now, realistic stiffness properties means that if you have a 50-story tower and over the top 35 stories, you know, the diaphragm is rigid, oh, you, you can assume it's rigid. That's a rational assumption. But when you get close to transfer areas, when you're getting close to the podium, the podium level and below, then you have to actually specifically model the diaphragm to show how the forces transfer. The uh, both shear and bending stresses in diaphragms must be considered. Uh, and at diaphragm discontinuities, openings, reentrant corners and stuff, then a special attention has to be paid to design of those. And peer reviewers usually look at those very carefully. If you are using response spectrum analysis, this is for serviceability. You use the, we use the ancient 100%, 30% rule. In nonlinear dynamic analysis, there is no load combination. You use the dead load with, with expected live load, which is about 25% of unreduced live load, and then you apply earthquake in both directions at the same time. Notice that there is no R factor, omega naught factor, rho factor, and CD factor in this procedure. Obviously, P delta effect has to be included in all analysis. Now, I'm not going to get into modeling nonlinear behavior because Greg is going to go into that in, in detail, but you can use a lot of different modeling techniques from continuum to fibers to concentrated plasticity. Uh, you can use those. Um, today's practice, concentrated plasticity models are used for beams and columns, and fiber elements are used commonly for walls. As I said earlier, any element or component that, co in, uh, uh, that the components that in combination significantly contribute to, la to total or local stiffness must be included in the mall. Oxywell deformation of gravity columns in a core wall system is one example of that effect and should be included in the malls. Now, I'm just going to touch over this because Greg is going to go into details into this. There are various ways to modeling a strength and stiffness relationship and particularly degradation. Uh, there are four approaches uh, that are explained in peer TBI. Practitioners, we are lazier than academics, so we pick two of them. So these two is good enough for us. So the first two are the ones that are adopted by LA. All, the, 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 all four of them are in the peer TBI, and they are in, the, Greg is going to go over these, so I'm not going to go over them. Soil foundation and structure interaction is also, you know, twenty, and you know, as you will see, you don't get a whole lot uh, discount by using soil structure interaction for tall buildings. You know, if you have a nuclear facility, yes, you get a lot of discount. But for tall buildings, usually you don't get a whole lot of discount. You, you get more information. Uh, there are two recommended approaches which came out of the work that John Stewart and I did for CSMIP. Uh, again, Pierre picks two techniques, one for serviceability, one for uh, co MCE collapse prevention. LA tall building just uses one. And actually, the method that we suggest, the LA tall building suggests, is that just ignore the soil. Ignore the soil doesn't mean that you don't design for active pressure of the soil and the stuff that comes by the soil. But for, for the analysis, because I have seen that, you know, people come in and then they come and design and they put this together and they say, well, where is your active pressure? So your guideline doesn't say put the active pressure. Now, the guideline doesn't say, but, you know, got to put it there. So. This is the way most of these done, and this is the bathtub model that John Stewart and I came up with, which is fancier. Honestly, God, I haven't seen anybody do that. 
So although this is in Pierre Tall building document, here we go. This is in Pierre Tall building document for MCE or nonlinear evaluation. None of the buildings that I have peer reviewed have done this. Everybody does this, the one in the middle. Now, if your foundations are flexible, if rocking and uplift happens, that could be to your advantage in some cases, controlled ones, then those effects should be considered in the models. If you are using seismic modification devices, <coughs> more power to you, but you have to address the consequences of reaching limits of those devices. If you are using, for example, dampers and you design each damper to go extend four inches, you have to sort of explain what would happen if the damper locks. What would the effect of that thing? Or if you have uh, a base isolation on a particular part of the building or whatever that uh, has a limited moat distance to that wall, what would happen if you hit the wall? So you have to, you know, being advanced is good, but you have to address the limitation of the technology that you're using. The backstay effect, um, which again, uh, Greg is gonna explain more, is when you come down and the building geometry changes when you hit the podium and then you transfer the loads outside to the basement walls. Uh, ATC 72 has detailed provisions on how to do backstay effects. Pierre TBI adopts that. LA Tower Building, you know, having gone through a few of these, the 2014 version of LA Tower Building says, you know, Varying the stiffnesses of the diaphragms and the walls and stuff you know, requires a lot of runs. But basically, if you really crack the diaphragms and bound the diaphragms, you will get the basic results with about one third of the computation that you need to go through and analysis that you have to do. So the LA approach is much more simple than the uh, peer approach. Damping is, you know, a, a thorny issue. Uh, <coughs> both documents limit this to two and a half percent because they think that, you know, your analysis is going to take care of the hysteretic damping. Both documents let you do either of these for your ground motion scaling. You can do a code scaling. Uh, you can do a spectral matching or you can do conditional mean spectrum. Uh, code by bringing everything up so that on average you are above the uh, target spectrum. A spectral matching by changing the f content either in, in time domain or frequency domain messing with the um, content of the data so that it, you get a response spectrum that is identical or near identical to your target spectrum and conditional mean spectrum which is you sort of bring in the scale in a way that you, you match the target spectrum at a specified period which is usually the first period of the building. Uh, you have to use a minimum of seven pairs. If you use conditional mean spectrum LA document requires you to use at least two sets of pairs and basically, if you use peer, you end up using two sets of pairs anyhow. And, and you should pay attention to cover the higher modes. Uh, and there are rules for that. Most engineers prefer matching because it makes their life simple, because there is not a lot of dispersion. Now, that might be sort of self, you know, if you, you are trying to look at the dispersion and see the variation, you would say, why do you do that? They do that because it's simple. They get the same results. They have seven runs. When they do the first one, they have a feeling for what the other six is going to be. And that gives them predictability. Uh, it's, that's why engineers like that. But then if you are trying to, to actually look at the variance in the data or dispersion, you could be totally off because you are actually using sort of the same data in all seven runs. So that's why in, in LA document we say use, you know, for critical items, we say use one and a half times mean. We don't rely on a standard deviation because we know a lot of people are using, you know, match records in which the statistics are not, you know, that reliable. 
LA has more specifics on design of concrete systems. For example, we require beams in the areas that are supposed to see significant inelasticity to be detailed like columns. And there are a specific requirement for high strength concrete design in LA document. Both documents require peer review. Uh, there is another talk about peer review later today. We'll go into details of those. Instrumentation, uh, peer document doesn't have any. LA document, starting from 2011 actually, has detailed requirement which requires the building to be instrumented basically according to CGS CSMIP rules, that is extensive instrumentation. So you have anywhere between 15 sensors to 30 sensors in your building. And actually that has, in Los Angeles, we have enforced it, and we are getting a lot of instrumented buildings in Los Angeles, which is gonna help a lot in learning about the behavior of these systems in the future. And I highly recommend other jurisdictions to adopt the same thing. Owners, you know, nag a couple of times, but then they come along. So this is an example, actually, courtesy of John Hooper, who was sitting right there, now is there. Uh, this is the building in San Francisco. Uh, according to CGS rules, we don't name buildings, although everyone knows which building we are talking about. Uh, the one that I'm not gonna mention, but you know what it is. And actually this one uh, saw some um, records due to the uh, earthquake that just happened uh, a while back around here. And this building actually because of its height and configuration is, um, is instrumented in a, I would say the first joint effort by USGS and uh, CDMG. And each one of them put about 30, 40 sensors in this. So it's loaded with sensors. So it's, it's gonna be a gold mine in the future. As you see, the uh, CSMIP sensors here are in red and the USGS sensors are in green and they are both in the same network. You get the same results. You get the results and you can, and these are the layout. It's in, in your handout, the layout of sensors. And then if you go to the uh, Strong Motion Center, uh, data uh, website that is available to everybody. You see that you know the data is recorded. Uh, you can look at the acceleration, displacement, and you can actually check to see what period this small earthquake excited for the building or what frequency the building had before or after the event. Acceptance criteria. The key differences to be aware of and actually I have a couple of corrections to this slide that I would like you to make when we get to there. Uh, reduction factors in LA tall building fee is always one. So that, that, that's it. In peer TBI, fee is one for serviceability if you use nonlinear dynamic procedure. So that's one is missing in the slide. So add to that point. Fee is one if you use NDP for serviceability. Otherwise, you have to use code fee values, according to peer. Uh, fee equals to M. Fee equals to code value for MCE according to uh, peer TBM. Okay. Risk categories. LA Tall Building has brought in the risk categories in a very simple way. There, you know, there is categories, occupancy categories that you have I factor of one, 1.25, you know, 1.5, whatever. Uh, we have brought in because there were a couple of buildings that, you know, at the beginning, they were argued if it is category two or category three. Uh, at the time, uh, 2010 peer assumes the building to be category two. Modeling the dispersion in LA we use one and a half times mean there is a correction you need to do to the last uh, bullet here and that is in peer TBI you use mean plus and you cross that one point half times mean and say you use mean plus 1.3 to 1.5 a standard deviation which should be larger than 1.2 mean. 
So this is the way, you know, this is the sophisticated approach to modeling risk category. We looked at the I factor, and then we did one over the I factor is what we limit the displacement to uh, for category T. The, the importance is 1.25, so we allow 0.8, which is 1 over 1.25 of the limits that we would use, 80% of the limit that we would have used for the category two building. And because it would be draconian to use the same rule for category four buildings, we, we defer that to the peer review. So talk to peer review and come up with an appropriate fact. Now, there is an absolute maximum drift criteria for serviceability. Overall drift shall not exceed half a percent. For MCE, the drift average at any story should not exceed 3% if you are a category two building. You know, if you are a category three building, you multiply that by 0.8. And in any story, from any analysis, it should not exceed 4.5%. Residual drift, the drift that stays after the earthquakes are gone, finished, is 1% for average of time histories, 1.5% maximum of any. This is sort of, the, this residual drift is put in there to make your building repairable after the event, because if you have too much tilt, then it's difficult to repair the building. In a strength loss, in any nonlinear analysis, you cannot lose more than 20% of your initial strength. So you can come down the backbone curve, but you cannot come down more than 20%. As I said earlier, for serviceability, if for forced controlled actions, you stay 70% uh, of the capacity. For uh, deformation controlled, if you are going with uh, the um, response spectrum, we can go to one and a half times. And if you are using nonlinear, the LA document says you can use, you can go up to the immediate <laughs> occupancy values of ASC 41. <coughs> I mentioned these before. <laughs> So these are sort of the differences that you, there should be more on the top of this, but I don't see it. For uh, force controlled members, we are seeing here, you know, this couple factor is there for, for category, for, for the occupancy category, or risk category, and then, you know, one document uses one and a half times the mean, the other uses means plus, plus a standard deviation. I'm highlighted that the stuff that is different in these two documents, they are not that different. One is using the one and a half times mean for critical forces, the other uses mean plus some percentage of a standard deviation. Yeah, well, that's why that was missing. Force control the actions, the, the animation came late. Uh, Next time I should do a better job. If it is non-critical action, then then the, 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 it's similar, but you don't get that amplification. Now, both documents limit the axial forces that you can put on reinforced concrete columns. Uh, the LA tall building limits this to 0.4 uh, gross concrete capacity. Uh, peer limits it to 0.3 uh, gross capacity. Uh, and actually there is a bulletin in works in LA that would be published by the end of this week by LA Tower Building that would sort of for dual systems it requires you to, if you are doing code based design, because in concrete columns you don't need to use omega naught in the steel columns you have. So there are clarifications in there because the way we are doing columns, particularly for tall buildings, and if you go dual, might be very unconservative if you go according to code forces. Uh, for deformation controlled actions, you know, if you, you bring those kappa in, you basically go to primary collapse limits in ASC 41. This is pretty conservative because generally you are allowed to go to secondary uh, 
uh, collapse prevention if you are doing nonlinear analysis and you are modeling degradation. Here you can also still go there, but then you have to control the op to control what happens because any time your capacity falls tw more than 20% below the cap, uh, you have to come back and either fix it or explain it. The base shear capacity of the structure should never fall below 90% of its maximum. Pier is not as rigid and, and basically refers to ASC 41 as a source of information. It doesn't require you to exactly use it, although everyone does. Examples, as was said, many buildings have been used, uh, designed using these uh, procedures. In Los Angeles, uh, 888 Olive, 1133 Olive, there are two more there. Uh, 1212 Flora Towers, Wilshire and Grant, Metropolis, uh, in San Diego, in San Francisco, and you will see some of these. These are just examples of these. I'm not gonna go over them. Oh, the other way around, laterally. Uh, oh man, <coughs> I guarantee you, when I gave these to ERI, <laughs> they were not on their side. <laughs> the transfer tower that uh, you are going to hear about this afternoon, and with that, I thank you very much.